Jeffrey Herbst. I am president of American Jewish University in Los Angeles. Today, it's a real pleasure to welcome Joshua Cohen, author of The Netanyahu's. Joshua is the author of several books. He's received awards in Israel and the United States and was noted by as one of the uh, Granada's new best young American novelists in 2017. Joshua, congratulations on the book and thanks so much for being with us on launch day today. Oh, thank you for, thank you for having me. This is a very interesting book. Uh, it's uh, part of a long tradition of campus novels where there's a lot to write about uh, and the foibles with the different occupants of college campuses. Uh, but it's also a book about a real person and a real family uh, in a semi-fictionalized setting. So could you explain to the audience the origin story, why you were inspired to write The Netanyahu's, which has the subtitle, An Account of a Minor and Ultimately Even Negligible Episode in the History of a Very Famous Family? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think the Netanyahu's in the book are uh, the real people. I, I, I don't know if the Netanyahu's themselves would agree that that that, that when they appear in the book, they are in fact as they were uh, in the winter of 1959 to 1960, uh, though the kids might be too young to remember it. Um, I, I, I got to know the literary critic, uh, Harold Bloom toward the end of his life. Um, literary critic, I think is a, you know, lots of people are literary critics. I worked as a literary critic. It's not a very big uh, word. It's not a very, you know, for Harold, you need uh, sort of a, a larger epithet like King, right? King Harold. Harold Bloom is, is, was uh, um, uh, a passionate, um, deeply intelligent, fiercely intelligent, scarily uh, uh, penetrating uh, literary scholar. Um, and, and I got to know him. Uh, he summoned me up to his home in, in New Haven that he, he shares with, uh, I shared at the time with his wife, Jean. And uh, this is toward the end of his life. And um, he had read something of mine that he liked and he wanted to talk to me about it, which, you know, uh, going to Jewish men of a certain age. And, you know, if you're the younger Jew coming to, you know, it, it means that he's telling me what I should be writing next. You know, is, is it, he told me what he liked about the book, but really it was, you know, what he didn't like about the book. And I wanted to hear from him about something other than myself. I mean, I think it was a little scary to hear him, be, you know, talk about me. And so I, I was trying to get stories out of him because he lived a, a long and colorful life. And, you know, there were stories about Jacques Derrida, there were stories about Valdemar, there were stories about uh, Philip Roth, and then, you know, Netanyahu uh, was on CNN kind of in the background and he goes, oh, I met him. And I'm thinking, oh, did you meet, you know, Bibi Netanyahu, I don't know, when he was UN ambassador or something, or I had some picture of some weird cocktail party that I'm not invited to on the Upper West Side or something. And he said, no, no, I think he was uh, like 10 years old when I hosted his father, Benzio Netanyahu on a, on a campus visit. And he proceeded to tell me this story and I was fascinated by it because it seemed to me some sort of a microcosm of of, or an allegory for, uh, uh, for the sort of one particular type of Jewish debate that, that is going on, a very important Jewish debate kind of going on uh, in contemporary Jewish life. And I kept on saying, Harold, can you tell it again? Can you tell it again? Because he went in his 80s and every time you would tell something, it was even with his memory, it was slightly different or certainly with his creativity, it was slightly different every time. And, and then when he passed away, I couldn't get the story out of my, my head. And so I wrote it down. So this story is about Ben Zion Net Netanyahu, the father, uh, a distinguished uh, historian, but also a political activist visiting uh, a college campus, which looks like Cornell University in upstate New York. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, Ben Zion Netanyahu was, 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 was sort of persona non grata um, for a number of reasons um, uh, in Israel. He was, uh, he was a follower of, of, of Vladimir Zev Jabotinsky. He was a revisionist Zionist. Um, uh, who were certainly out of favor among the kind of early labor Zionist founders of the state. And for many reasons, um, he couldn't get a job in Israel and that found him kind of uh, completing his PhD and, and sort of something that I'm very sympathetic to of peddling yourself around the kind of freelance adjunct market in America. And it's just so happened that he has this interview and Harold who 
was in the uh, English department, not in the history department, was called upon to kind of be the chaperone to show to show Benzio and Netanyahu around because, you know, he was the only other Jew up there at the time. And so they thought, you know, he's one of yours. Take him around. And uh, and instead of showing up alone, Benzio Netanyahu shows up with his wife, Tzila, uh, his oldest son, uh, Yoni Netanyahu, the hero of, of Antebi, uh, his middle son, Bibi, and his youngest son, Ido. Joshua, you begin the, the, the story, uh, uh, the book, with a uh, quote from Jabotinsky, uh, who says, eliminate the diaspora or the diaspora will eliminate you. Um, Why did you choose that? Because I think, you know, it's this stupid strategy that I've, 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 I've kind of hit upon, that if you put your most extreme sentence first and the reader doesn't immediately shut the book, then you have the right reader. You know, I, I wrote a number, I wrote a book called Book of Numbers in 2015. It's a kind of a book about the early days of the internet, um, uh, 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 kind of the beginning of, 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 of search technology. And the first line of that book is, if you're reading this on a screen, fuck off. You know, and I thought, you know, if someone can make it through that first sentence, then they're gonna be with me the rest of the way. So here's this, you know, it was the same thing with, with this epigraph. I mean, Jabotinsky was a, um, the problem with Jabotinsky, I mean, this is a good way to begin a sentence. The problem with Jabotinsky, right, is that, um, is that he was um, violent and, um, and pitiless almost with, you know, without mercy about the, the absolute need for a Jewish state. And at the same time, history proved him right because he was the person who was running around in the thirties like a chicken with his head cut off saying, um, all of European jury will be destroyed. We need to get them out immediately. We need to raise an army, not just to defend the land, but even a Jewish army to go fight the Nazis. And, and you know, so this was a person who was very much a, a person whose politics were by, by any means necessary, by all means necessary. And, uh, 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 and yet, you know, he was someone whose, um, whose relationship to the early statehood is deeply complicated because you know, his concept was unlike Ben Gurion, unlike uh, a lot of the other figures of early of early uh, Zionism. His idea was we're not going to wait for the British to give us a state. You know, we're not going to wait until the great powers of the world decide that we have suffered enough and now we deserve one. We're going to take it, and that 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 led him to uh, acts of terror, not just against. Uh, the native Palestinian, the Arab population of, 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 of Palestine, but against the British as well. And you note that uh, he was buried, in fact, in Long Island and only later exhumed and taken to Israel. Right, right. And, you know, and, and I, I, you know, there are a few rumors that are still floating around. Of, was it really his bones in that bag or did they just find some bones in Long Island? Right. I mean, I, I think I think for me that that idea of, you know, eliminate the diaspora or, or the diaspora eliminate you is interesting to me, um, you know, from its opposite. Right. Because on one hand, there is this idea that 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 this is the way a Jew treats the diaspora um, because the diaspora has treated the Jew in, in, in that way. And the, the inverse of that statement kind of flows throughout and, is, and has been used many times as the counterpoint to that statement, which is eliminate Zion or Zion will eliminate you. Meaning, you know, can Jewish identity only thrive without its remaking in the image of Zionism? And, and these are the two poles that I explore in the book because these are the two poles that have riven the Jewish community between an American Jewish community that by and large, at least of my generation and younger is, 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 is fairly far left certainly compared to their parents' generation. And, uh, and, and this same generation in Israel, who, um, and, and family I have there, who grew up with the Second Intifada, who are farther right than I think any previous generation in Israel. So the gap has never been wider. And it was sort of the attempt, it was my attempt to understand the nature of that widening gap and, and to have a conversation across that gap in the, in really at, at, at the roots of that. Uh, a divergence, which I'm putting really with, you know, a kind of classic FDR, New Deal liberal, and uh, and a Jabotinskyite. When you started the book, I'm sure you were familiar with Benzion Netanyahu, learned much more. After deep exploration, writings, his actions, his life, um, his family, 
what have you learned about him that you didn't know when you started? Uh, I think this is maybe appropriate to say a few days after Father's Day, I learned to be appreciative of my own father, that he was fairly unlike Benzio Netanyahu. <laughs> um, Benzio Netanyahu was uh, um, a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man and a very frustrated man, but a man full of, 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 of resentment that, that in a way, um, he, he was, in his mind, he was prevented from his destiny. Um, there is this odd rhyme, right? I mean, you know, there's, it's a familiar trope of the right wing here of, you know, the immigrants are taking away, quote, our jobs, whoever we are, right? And, uh, uh, and then there's this notion of Benzio Netanyahu, who's, who's, who's not a sober, but comes very young and grows up in, in, in Palestine, um, where, uh, uh, and his Hebrew is, 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 is as close to native as that generation has, right? And uh, where every year that he's rising in the academic ranks, a new great historian from a university in Munich a university in Berlin, a university of in, in, in you know in Krakow, they're coming in, and these are you know the the leading academic lights of Europe are seeking asylum or seeking refuge in Palestine, and he finds himself unable to kind of get a job. Um, in addition to his you know political work, which which makes him sort of persona non grata, I, I think I learned really to appreciate um, this idea of not rejecting one's political enemies, but always keeping lines of communication open because um, what is allowed to sort of fester in darkness um, does come back and bite you later on. Um, uh, uh, certainly BB seems like a return of the repressed of the entire revisionist movement. Um, I, think, I think another thing is an appreciation really for history and historiography. Um, you know, Benzio Netanyahu, I, I only mean this partially as a, as a slight, was an excellent fiction writer. He was an excellent writer, but he wasn't trying to write fiction, he was a historian and he really understood the necessity of storytelling to the nation building process. And I, I appreciated that enormously. And, and I think I also came to understand his, um, his attempts to save what he prized of Jewish cosmopolitan, uh, cosmopolitanism, which is you know, a certain uh, fluency in various world cultures and a certain belief in, um, and a certain belief in academic exchange and his sort of willingness to sacrifice that on an altar of particularism or of the parochial. Uh, that seemed to me a, um, uh, 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 what's the word? A self-negating act of odd insanity and courage. Benzion Netanyahu's major work, The Origin of the Inquisition in 15th Century Spain features in the book. Um, not, so not only the book itself, but the criticisms of the book that he's writing about the Inquisition through the lens of history. And mm. Maybe you could talk about that um, and why uh, why this book uh, is so important, so important as both for what it signals about the older Netanyahu, uh, but also um, uh, its view of history. Well, I mean, I think this is what makes it, which which I hope makes you know my own book sort of pertinent to, to today and maybe the American present, which is Benzio Netanyahu has the idea that it's really with the Spanish uh, uh, with the Iberian Inquisitions, the Spanish and later Portuguese Inquisition, which are not papal inquisitions, but are uh, the inquisitions of, of a monarchy, you know, they, that they are they're run by, um, by, by their political inquisitions run by uh, the nobility and the monarchy, um, that this marks the real modern moment that treats uh, that creates the idea of Judaism as a race, um, uh, because he says, you know, there are all of these Jews who converted uh, 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 to Catholicism um, between really the the purging of the Moorish influence, uh, 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 the Reconquista, right, the purging of the Moorish influence and control of Iberia, and the reassertion of, of of Catholic hegemony, and and all of these Jews who now are kind of liberated, quote unquote, from the you know the Moorish yoke. As, as Netanyahu would put it, um, now uh, 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 convert to Catholicism, sort of convert willingly, happily, because it advances them uh, in business, it advances them, um, uh, uh, it advances their, their freedoms, they're suddenly allowed to live where they wanna live and, and do business in the way they wanna do business. And, and, um, and, and yet the Inquisition comes along uh, uh, after a long period of these conversions and begins invalidating these conversions. It says, you know, we don't believe you. 
We don't believe you're really Catholic. We don't believe you've really given up this. And they begin forcibly deconverting Jews, right? And so it's been Zion's Netanyahu's question of why does this happen? And, uh, uh, and it's his idea that, 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 first of all, the mechanism, forget for a second the mechanism of, of making this happen. He says the Catholic Church does this because it be begins to apply a new definition to Jewish life. It's not a religion, it's a race. It begins to really accept what, you know, what Jews themselves had had an uneasy relationship with for a very long time. And it begins to deeply racialize uh, 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 Judaism. And it's Benzio Netanyahu's belief that it was done because, um, because essentially the Goyim always need something to hate because it's useful to have a Jewish population that, that a nobility, for example, or a monarchy can blame things on in order to distract the populace's um, anger at their exploitation at the hands of their leaders. They can say, oh, it's not me, Alfonso X, who's doing this to you, it's the Jews. It's, you know, it's not Ferdinand or Isabella who's doing this to you, it's the Jews. So it, it, they were a useful scapegoat. And it was Benzio Netanyahu's interpretation of this, which is still a very controversial interpretation, that he really uh, 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 sets out this idea of the racialization of Jewishness. So it says, it doesn't matter what you say or what you claim, um, you are a Jew if you are a Jew by blood, using you know, the, the, the blood principles of, 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 of Catholic Spain. And he, of course, by implication, intimately ties the inquisitions of Spain to the Nazi Holocaust. Joshua, let's talk about the dynamics of the campus novel and start with the, the narrator, Reuben Bloom, uh, a Jewish historian, but not a historian of the Jews. Yeah. And um, when you were constructing him, um, uh, what, what did you hope to, what did you hope he would represent? I wanted to do that, you know, that really dirty word that you're not allowed to say anymore. I wanted to make a liberal, right? I wanted to just, uh, 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 I, I, I think about him as sort of a classic, classic liberal um, in the sense of he feels that he is open to all and to, to he'll take all comers. Um, he feels that he is open to ideas and to compromise. But in many ways, you know, he's the liberal who lets this hardliner into his home because he hosts Benzio Netanyahu. And it's the idea of, you know, the liberal says, sir, come visit me at home. You know, sure, um, my daughter will babysit your three boys. I'm, a, you know, sure, come and eat my food. Sure, your wife can borrow my wife's clothes and jewelry to wear to the lecture tonight. Sure, your son can eventually sleep with my daughter, right? It's the idea of a liberal who gives and gives and gives and gives not realizing that, that, that in that classic liberal sense, you know, he is his own worst enemy. By being unable to know where to draw a line, being unable to draw a line at all, uh, the question is, is, is to what uh, uh, forces uh, is he prey? To what, um, what, what, what horror can come into his life by his desire to accommodate? And, uh, and what makes a man like this his own worst enemy? And what makes, uh, and, and is there any way to be a liberal without being one's own worst enemy. I, I feel like I wanted to work through, through these questions with him. You made him, interestingly, a historian of taxation. Yeah. Uh, why was that? Because I wondered if one, if that field existed and I was, you know, to, taxation studies, it sounds good. Um, no, I mean, I, I couldn't write Harold Bloom. I mean, who could? I mean, he, 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 uh, I, no one would believe Harold if you tried to write Harold. Uh, 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 such beauty and such passion and such intelligence, it just, it, it would seem a, a caricature and, uh, 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 or it would seem hagiographic hey, in a way that, that, that I wouldn't be comfortable with. And so, uh, uh, but Harold's, you know, most popular uh, uh, book um, is The Anxiety of Influence. And, you know, the very brief kind of potted Wikipedia summary of this is that, is that, you know, all writers and really you can extrapolate, you know, creative artists are, you know, their output or what they make, their creations are made in response to uh, the past, the influences. And, you know, if one is kind of strong, um, one can, can, can hold up against uh, a, 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 a past influence, like a writer who came before and sort of write against them. But many times, it, you know, there are 
these kind of weaker people who can merely um, uh, imitate or create kind of um, brittle versions of something that came in the past. But it was really Harold's belief in his kind of his use or of his importation of, 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 of psychoanalysis or Freud into literary criticism, the idea that, that we all kind of respond to the past, to influence of the past through a, um, a, a misreading of the past, a misunderstanding of it, whether conscious or more usually unconscious reaction to, uh, to history. And, and, you know, I always thought about this idea of influence and how we deal with influence as the tax that history uh, exacts from you. The idea that we all have a debt to the past. Um, I, I always think about that word debt when it's applied. You know, I, I think about debt way too much as I'm sure many students do in, in other contexts. And, and so the idea of a debt to the past. So I thought maybe a, a professor of taxation studies who thought about sort of how the history of uh, imposing taxes on people and how that led to uh, instances of revolt and political revolution, uh, which is his particular field, would be interesting when, when sort of mingled with Harold's theories. Josh, well, there's a long history, and I'm a consumer of the campus novel. Uh, lots of authors have found uh, uh, it to be a very, uh, uh, very productive area, lots of targets, lots of targets of, for fun and ridicule. Um, and uh, too many authors to name have been part of it, uh, that tradition. How do you see yourself fitting in and in, in writing the, the next great campus novel? Well, I mean, I think that 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 in a weird way, the world has become a campus since the heyday of the campus novel. I mean, I think one of the thoughts about the campus novel is with unity of, you know, what is it? Unity of location, unity of, 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 of place, unity of time, right? Those ideas of setting a story in a certain uh, a place with a certain number of characters that happens over a certain time span. The university was always very conducive to this, right? And especially because of its power hierarchy is already in place. You know, one could understand, uh, 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 one didn't have to explain too much uh, of the kind of furniture in the room uh, uh, to a reader of a campus novel. But one of the thoughts about the campus novel was that, you know, a campus was there to kind of keep, you know, the intellectuals uh, safe from the world and keep the world safe from the intellectuals. And it was this kind of, you know, walled readout, uh, 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 you know, walls kind of thicker and stronger than the walls of Jerusalem, you know, that would never be breached where, where, where we would all kind of debate uh, the world as um, as 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 the world went on merrily, un, you know, un, unawares of 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 our discussion outside, and and I think that that there was always that question of what was the connection between the campus and 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 general life, right? And I think that that a lot of old campus novels kind of the world poured into the campus, and you would begin to see something like you know McCarthyism, you know, which came from outside the campus kind of play in uh, 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 on the stage of campus life. Now I kind of see the opposite. I see a lot of these discussions happening on campus. Um, I think because a lot of people's lives have been frozen in academic training for a number of economic and you know, socioeconomic reasons. And I think that, that, that the questions of academia have bled out to become the questions of, uh, uh, of the world in general. Um, you know, questions of, 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 you know, what are our traditions, what are our histories, what are our canons, who can speak, you know, um, where are our places that, where are our safe spaces, who can determine what that safety means, you know, the, the, all of these um, uh, 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 ideologies which have been cooking in American campuses really since the, the introduction of theory, uh, 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 so for the last half century in American campuses have have you know they've always periodically exploded onto the uh, you know onto the, the the political stage, but now they seem to have um, um, through the internet become uh, uh, the common media discourse. And so uh, so you know I I love Penin by by Nabokov. I love you know Mary McCarthy's campus novel. I love you know I I, I even like some bits of David Lodge. I like um, but 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 truthfully. Um, you know, the two campuses that I was thinking of with this novel were the campus of Israel, because, you know, Israel is a, you know, is, is, is sort of a campus with a nuclear program. And I was also thinking about um, the campus of Twitter. What's the state today of the Jewish novel in America? Uh, in America? We saw after World War II an explosion of Jewish authors who in many ways dominated the literary scene, not so much now. Is there a, well, well, how do you feel uh, 
writing as a Jew, writing about Jews, but uh, is there something to say about the Jewish novel in America today? Yeah, I don't, you know, I, I, I think I would drop the word American in a sense. Um, I think that, that, that the, every novelist who writes now, you know, they hope to be read by, um, uh, they hope to be authentic to their own communities, however constituted, uh, and to the and to speak most intimately to the people that they you know are 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 uh, in contact with and inspired by, uh, uh, or writing against, and they're also contending with a public that's larger than ever, right? So at the same time, one has to be authentic to one's community, and yet there is access through the internet to 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 hundreds of millions of people. And it's very difficult to speak intimately to such a large audience. I think that the generation that you're talking about, with you know the, the Roth, you know Bello Malamo generation, Roth in particular, they were so concerned to, to to kind of beat their breast about how American they were. You know, they, they 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 and it's almost poignant now and touching to see how concerned they were with demonstrating their Americanness. Um, I, I think that 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 really. There's hardly any country in the world that isn't touched by uh, by American interests. There hardly is a country in the world that isn't influenced, you know, by the the flapping of the wings of a dragonfly in America, right? And 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 truthfully, um, I, I I think that that the the novelist subject has, you know, where the novelist subject and audience has always been the world in possibility, and 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 so the idea that there's a a national uh, brand on it, um, to me, is 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 difficult, and and I, I include Jewish in that as well. I I, I want to be read, uh, and I write for and against uh, the people I know. And let's be honest, uh, most of them are Jews. Um, uh, but but um, but there is a sense of um, there is a sense of wanting to the world could recognize the authenticity. Of, of, of my parochial ideas. And I want to, to, to not water down my specificity for the world, but I'm always conscious that the world is there. Uh, member of the audience writes, is writing a straight comedy different process from constructing the darker mode of moving kings? Both deal with modern day Israel vis-a-vis -vis American Jewry, but are very different reading experiences. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know that this is a, you know, I don't like a straight comedy, I don't know. Um, I think uh, when I was writing Moving Kings, I think I was pretty happy. Uh, and when I was writing Netanyahu, it was, it was the beginning of lockdown and quarantine. So I think, you know, I, I tend to write the opposite of how I live. Uh, um, I think that, that a lot of the things in Netanyahu's uh, uh, respond to, respond to uh, uh, some of the media, let's say, of, of the time in which it's set. Um, early television, early sitcoms, uh, which themselves kind of respond to a lot of the kind of kitchen sink drama uh, uh, that you find of the, uh, uh, of the 30s and 40s. And, uh, and so for me, it wasn't about being easier or harder, or it was about kind of being truer to a certain model that I had established for, for myself. And, um, and, and also, frankly, uh, there was a sense in writing comedy where it's, um, it is harder in one sense where, where uh, you know, when you do something serious, you're not competing against much except maybe death. But when you're, when you're writing comedy, you're competing against, you know, all the comedies that are out there in, in, you know, on, 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 on our screens. And truthfully, I was just tired of this, um, of, the, of what I call the tyranny of comedy. I was tired of this, yeah, I'm trying not to curse here, this reign of comedy of you know of this Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld nonsense where they and especially this kind of behind the scenes comedy thing where comics talk about how difficult it is to write comedy and how much of a craft it is, it's you know uh, uh, if you read real writers, you know a real writer is as funny as most comedy writers for the screen, with about one of their fingers. You know, and so this is like a part of the incentive to write this book was to sort of prove to the world that like, it ain't that hard. 
and come for the comedy and you'll also get something else that you're missing when you're watching those other things. And if you want to miss those other serious things, then that's something that you should think about why you want to exclude certain, uh, uh, let's say the price of comedy or the price of the laugh after you laugh. Joshua, another uh, member of the audience writes, uh, what would Benzion think of Bibi's political career and views? And I know that must be a question that, um, and more generally, what can we learn about Bibi's future uh, from this book? Well, I mean, I think Benzion Netanyahu was a proud father. I think he also enjoyed saying, do it this way, or this is how I would have done it, except, you know, uh, 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 he's practicing his paternal advice on the level of statecraft. Uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, the, the Netanyahu's, Benzion Netanyahu lived, he was a centenarian. He lived over a hundred years old. I mean, he would say that his son has many more acts, probably. Another uh, audience member writes, in the spirit of Howard Bloom, how conscious of you are engaging in an agon with Roth, Bell, and Malmud? Do you purposely sit out to one-up them on their own thematic territory and explore untrodden ground within that territory? So a good literary question. Yeah, I don't know that I wrestle, I don't, you know. I mean, certainly not with, not with Malamud, not with Roth, maybe Bellow more. Um, I think, I, you know, I hear Bellow's music a little bit more. I think that his concept of history um, uh, uh, and his idea of, 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 of how he treats ideas is more interesting to me. But, um, but no, I don't necessarily wrestle with, with them. I mean, I think I have my own uh, uh, Thomas Mann uh, uh, would be someone that I have some, I've had some tussles with, I don't know. Um, it, it tends not to be the people who treat the same material that you treat. I, 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 I think it, it, it's, it's, it, it might be closer to someone who, who has the same, who is perceived or Bloom might say misperceived as having some of the same ambitions that, that you yourself harbor. Um, you know, there, there was a sense uh, with, with Bellow and with Roth um, I think especially that they were writing to a far wider audience than any one of my, or really I think most anyone uh, 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 that I respect of my generation would ever have access to. I mean, you know, these were men on, these were people on bestseller lists, right? And so they had an idea of what it means to sort of speak ex cathedra to a very large audience and a very, you know, large educated audience. And, 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 Part of wrestling with them is wrestling with the ways that they, with the part of the, I don't know who's thing that is. Part of, part of wrestling with them is, is, is in a way wrestling with how they would deal with uh, 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 such a large audience, you know? We have a very, literary informed audience today. Another member of the audience writes, can you talk about the formation of the structure of the novel? It certainly has a different shape than the two-part movement of Moving Kings or the big system novels that you previously have written. Uh, I like this. These are all students. I like this, you know, it's good. Yeah, yeah. Students uh, of all ages. Students of right. all ages. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I was about to get de defensive and say, oh, it's kind of a system. Uh, uh, two letters of recommendation, Benzio Netanyahu is, is applying for a job at Corbin College. At the same time, Judith uh, uh, Blum is applying to uh, go to, uh, 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 to get into college. So you have someone applying to be a professor, you have someone applying to be college. Uh, you have two letters of recommendation. There are two dinners set on two holidays, one Rosh Hashanah, the other one uh, Thanksgiving. Um, you know, there, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, architecture and planning in the way that, that these things are set up. Um, uh, uh, I, I really thought about uh, the idea of, of repetition in a joke. Uh, how long can you string the uh, uh, setup for a joke before a punchline? You know, how many repetitions can you have? Um, uh, uh, you know, how many rabbis, priests, you know, ministers and imams can you have walk into a bar before you you know, before you give the kicker. And so it was about delaying the Netanyahu's arrival, delaying their arrival, delaying their arrival. Um, 
so no, it was a lot of it was a lot of kind of conscious crafting of of of, of for pacing, uh, and so on. But but um, but I, I really wrote it as I wrote as I write everything, which is, you know, I kind of uh, 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 there's an emetic process, right? I vomit out what I I really want to say, and then I kind of see how incoherent it is, and I realize that you know that there I need to, you know, now that I have this you know gelatinous mass of flesh, I need to get the bones and put the bones in there so that so that the thing has some shape and uh, uh so it tends to always be this this uh back and forth between um creating materials structuring it creating material and structuring it another uh member of the another viewer writes can you talk a little bit more about what you mentioned before the campus of twitter uh, the campus and you as an author of a of a big book you know think about it <laughs> The, the campus of Twitter. I mean, you know, the, this. Huh, I mean, I think it's. I think it's interesting. It's. It's. You know, I grew up as I think, uh, 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 and I might be among the the last. Let's say of a. Uh, my generation might be, the last, if not one of the last generations, to grow up with this idea that, when one is reading fiction, right, you're reading, uh, uh, you know, an author's creation of characters, and that the characters. Uh, don't share the opinions uh, of, of the author, but the author is kind of using them whether you want it. There's so many theories you could have. The author is using them as mouthpieces of certain ideas, or the author is trying to be faithful to a, a, a real person who exists or a composite person who exists and try to depict their views uh, in such a way as to depict uh, a specific person, a type, a, 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 a confluence of ideas. And, uh, uh, and then there seems to be a, a social media uh, a cohort or generation that grew up really um, after the age of anonymous screen names where, uh, where, where your name is identified with all of your statements. So everything that you write uh, uh, is kind of, it must be interpreted, right? As a, uh, uh, as a statement that reflects you as the creator's own opinions. And so losing that fictional mask that allows us to inhabit, and not just inhabit, but represent other points of view. So I see Twitter as this place of utter identification between the utterance or the, the written remark and, uh, and someone's identity. And it's a permanent and ruthless uh, identification uh, uh, so that at any point in the future, one's comments can be dug up and identified with them no matter you know no matter how much you've changed or if you were just joking um i think then when i say the campus part of it is the way in which these uh, uh statements are then weighted and relativized in terms of speed in, in terms of politics um where um where suddenly uh in order to kind of parse their way through the certain valuation of of, of, of statements online um you have to kind of surround yourself with a tribe or a group that protects you and that you protect. And that the idea is that, you know, when you are, uh, you know, attacked, you sort of harden and your tribe hardens ideologically in order to, um, uh, 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 in order to kind of, in a sense, gain more space or gain more representation or, 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 or um, assert your identity in a, str in a stronger fashion. And all that to me really reminds me of, of, of campus wars because those things truly don't take place in workplaces, at least no workplace that I've worked at outside of academia. And it certainly doesn't take place um, or hasn't taken place, um, you know, in, in let's say the liberal spaces of, um, of bars uh, where I'm most comfortable. We're really grateful that you've taken the time to appear on the platform today. Thank you and congratulations again on the book. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it.